Good morning, everybody. It's so good to see all of you. Let's learn some Torah. Wanted to make sure that we remember that this is part, this week's learning, though we do it every single week and every single weekday for the last four and a half years, this week is the week of goodness, and we are dedicating all of our learning, all of our love, um, for the merit of the release of the hostages. So take a second with me, just before we begin the learning itself, and incline your heart, double down on your hope, and send the prayers that you can to those in positions of power that they make wise and redemptive decisions. Send your hearts and your strength to the families of the hostages who have been holding on and fighting for their loved ones, and send our hearts and our hope and all of our warmth to the hostages themselves, who for 285 days since October 7th have not been home, cruelly taken from home on October 7th. And so we are here dedicating everything we've got um, to those we love, those we love. And speaking of those we love, my Ariel's here. Nice to see you, my love. Okay. So it's Parshat Balak. Parshat Balak, as we know, tells a story of the king of Moab, whose name is Balak, who hires a non-Israelite prophet, whose name is Bil'am, to go and curse the Israel, to curse the Jewish people, because it's clear that through military means alone, Israel cannot be defeated, not if God is on their side. And so in order to fight God, as it were, or to fight the people, what they need to do is, uh, what Balak needs to do, is interrupt God's protection of B'nai Israel. So he sends messengers and gold to hire Bil'am. And we do not dismiss Bil'am's power. He is understood by the Torah and by the rabbis as possessing powerful, powerful prophetic capacity, so much so that the rabbis describe that he knows the heref ayin, the blink of an eye, when God is angry at B'nai Israel. And in that blink of an eye, that is when the Jewish people would be vulnerable and Balak and the kingdom of Moab could attack. Now, we spend, tradition spends a lot of time trying to understand who Bilam is and why, if he has that kind of capacity and that connectivity with God, why doesn't he have a love that expands to include everyone? Why is he a prophet for a hire, really? And he doesn't consider himself that. He said, I can only say that which God puts in my mouth. I can't curse anyone that God doesn't curse. I can't bless anyone that God doesn't bless. And we have in our Parsha the words that he eventually does say. It's the most amazing thing to hear these poetic words come out of Bilam's mouth, and it is a way that the Torah demonstrates the power of God, really, to interrupt even the power of that prophet. It's a strange way to think about it, but the miracle of God snatching the curse out of the air and replacing it with a blessing, well, that tells us what we are hoping will happen in our day, too. But there is something really interesting to think about in this case, which is, it's not surprising to the Torah that a non-Israelite prophet has power. It should be surprising to anyone who lives a life of the Spirit, by which I mean all of us, that Bilam's love doesn't include everyone. Prophetic love includes everyone. What is the limit? of love, when you are channeling God's own love. Who don't we love? Who wouldn't we love? The Midrash, actually, it's Bamidbar Rabbi, I have it on the side over here, it says that Bal Bil'am eventually lost compassion for the Jewish people because they weren't his tribe. And the text from Bamidbar Rabbi in translation says, the reason the section of Bil'am was recorded was to make it known why the Holy One of Blessing removed the Holy Spirit from others. Because this person came from them. Now, that's a negative way of saying it, just to be very clear. Because what the rabbis and B'midbar Rabbah are saying is that 
prophecy belongs within the Jewish people, but it is earned because we don't do what that text is saying. We don't limit our love. We will love beyond the tribe. The work of UJA in particular is demonstrative of this capacity. We place two enormous amounts of our energy in, well, more than two, but two that I've visited so far. We call them the Queens Hub and the Brooklyn Hub. Both of them are placed in places that we built buildings in places of significant Jewish poverty, but it's a place of general need. And so anyone can come in off the street and for the dignity of receiving food through a digital food pantry, which gives them human dignity and agency with doors marked dignity entrance and exit, because there are also um, services we provide. I broadcasted from the Brooklyn Hub just a few weeks ago where people can come in, likely women, who are um, experiencing domestic violence, intimate partner violence, and no one knows why they came in or why they leave or maybe even where they leave from. These are designed not only to take care of the Jewish community, but we don't ask anyone who they are when they come in. We are there to take care of everyone. The love we show and demonstrated with passion and precision by my dear friend Jonathan Ornstein, who's here from Krakow. As the executive director, CEO of the JCC in Krakow, he has shown what it is to wield a prophetic Jewish spirit in the world, even if he wouldn't use that language about himself, which I don't think he would, but everyone who knows you, my friend, does. Because not only is the JCC in Krakow and all of the work that Jonathan and many others do targeted to supporting Jewish life, raising up Jewish spirits and rebuilding what it is to have a Polish Jewish identity. As complicated historically as that is, there were a remarkable, miraculous moments of Torah and Jewish life happening because of the spirit that Jonathan and his family and an army of angels brings. But when the Ukraine war began, when Russia attacked Ukraine, Jonathan and the entire apparatus that UJA is so proud to partner with showed up and opened its doors, pivoting its mission in a heartbeat to welcome in refugees. And we don't ask what someone's faith is or what someone's background is. We show up. That's what it is to do something worthy, authentic in the name of our tradition. What Bil'am doesn't do is see the holiness in Bnei Israel. He can wield some of the divine power that a prophet has access to, but he loses the right to wield it by limiting God's love. And that is something in this moment that we're going to have to work hard to remember. I'm not saying any of this as if I find it easy. Natalie asked the question pretty plainly just now. How do we love those who are blatantly evil? Please explain. So let me say that there is a difference between people who are blatantly evil. Anyone who is a terrorist and acts in a way that demonstrates the dehumanization, the violent dehumanization of another, that's not who we're talking about. We're talking about vulnerable others. I'm not talking about loving terrorists. There has to be some way, theologically, and it's beyond me right now, of understanding how the image of God in which everyone is created can be subverted so much that someone that a human being could be a terrorist weaponizing power in a certain way that's what Bilam is meant to be seen as a terrorist someone who would use their power to destroy someone else which is why the text says the Midbar Rabbah says he loses the capacity for prophecy because he did exactly that. And what I would make sure that we do is we do not, um, we don't conflate these categories. But I would say that vulnerability is certainly experienced by everyone. You want to have some inspiration. The opposite of what Bilam demonstrates here. You want to have some hope? And have some inspiration when we are done. It's the first time in four and a half years, first time in 1,095 broadcasts, I'm giving you some homework. 
your homework, friends. And while I'm teaching, I hope someone will find it and place the link in the comments here on Facebook. Your homework is to find America's Got Talent last night, where the Jerusalem Youth Chorus, led by my dear friend Micah Hendler, the Jerusalem Youth Chorus, made up of Palestinians and Israelis who sing together, sing beautifully together. They've done a beautiful, beautiful version of Olam Chesed Yibana, recording it and sharing it with audiences around the world. But they sang um, Home, and they sang it on America's Got Talent, Palestinians and Israelis together. And a young Israeli man right in the front was wearing this. And the Palestinian to his left, and the Palestinian to his right, and the Israelis to their right and their left were singing. You want to know what the world could be? You want to know what Bilam wasn't able to see? The world could be a place where we make harmony together, where we make bridges everywhere we can, where we remember the message of that song that they sang last night, that it needs to be true. I'm going to make this world your home. I'm going to make this place your home. Obviously, in the middle of our moment, thank you, Joyce and Linda, for placing the link here. Obviously, in this moment, we have to remind ourselves and say very clearly, in order for us to love you well, in order for me to love you well, I have to be alive. And when my life is threatened, I have to defend my home. There's nothing unethical about that. There's nothing contradictory about this message. Bilam wasn't defending his home, and Balak wasn't defending his kingdom. They were acting in a way that dehumanized the other. Balak, because he saw another tribe as unworthy of being alive, he was coming from fear, but he was attacking, and Bilam, because he was a mercenary prophet. But we don't act that way. We will love, and we will expand the circles of belonging. When we say bring them home now, which we say, when we defend Israel's actions to defeat Hamas, which we must and they must, we in no way wish harm upon Palestinians. It cannot be. It cannot be. We cannot subvert our capacity to dehumanize anyone else. We are told 36 times in the Torah never to oppress a stranger because we were strangers in a strange land. That is the core of our Torah in the world, to be kind and to extend love beyond the tribe. Bil'am didn't understand that, so he lost prophecy. He misused the gifts he was given. We cannot forget. In our pain, we cannot forget. Sometimes in our fear, we cannot forget. We will take care of the world. We are that big. We are a small people and not punching beyond our weight, loving beyond our weight, loving beyond the tribe. All of the prophetic love that we have, it can be summed up in this lesson, which is we are meant to bring love. May we be blessed to follow the models of the Palestinian and Israeli singers in the Jerusalem Youth Chorus and be ambassadors of love. There's nothing more important. There's nothing the world needs more. We have to be a blessing. Yes, we have to defend ourselves, but we take no glee in any, in any of the fight. We just want everyone to have what they need, including us. We are meant, as Arlene said, to bring love and light. So let's be blessed. Let's decide to be blessed by being blessings. Let's learn from the mistakes of Bil'am what it is to bring love beyond. Let's do that. 
This is part of the week of goodness, my friends. So let's wish goodness into the world. When we are done, I hope you watch that video if you haven't. And when you're done watching the video, I hope you'll find one ma'asetov, one good deed to do. Maybe today we can make an effort, a double effort, to do something kind beyond the tribe. Let's be blessings. Let's send our hearts to the East. Sing with me, friends. Kolon valeva penima nefesh Yehudi homia ulefate mizrach kadima ayin letzion sofia ulo avda. Tikvatenu, ha tikva bat shnot alpayim, liot am choshi, beyartsenu, eretz zion virushalayim, liot am choshi, beyartsenu. Eretz Zion Virushalayi. Bring them home now. Am Yisrael Chai. See you tomorrow, friends. Take care.